สวัสดีครับ Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today is our Pali Canon and English Study Group. I'm really pleased that you decided to join us today because we're going to be starting a new book in this book series. We've been starting from Volume Two of the Words of the Buddha book series, moving all the way to Volume 13, which then will actually restart the program over. We're starting Volume 12 today, which is titled Lowly Arts. This is a book that you're going to learn a lot about how the Buddha spoke and how he taught and how he guided the ordained practitioners, because there's a path to enlightenment that involves things like the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, and other teachings. It's the Eightfold Path that is the core and central teaching that everything plugs into. And this is what everyone would need to learn and practice in order to get to enlightenment. And then for ordained practitioners, there's a separate set of teachings that's actually distinguished as a separate part of the Pali Canon. And the average household practitioner doesn't necessarily study this part of the Pali Canon. But here in this book, The Lowly Arts, there's some teachings here where the Buddha is actually teaching directly to ordained practitioners very specific things related to their practice, which is unique to them and is not really involving household practitioners. But the interesting thing is, is that by studying the teachings that the Buddha shared with ordained practitioners, there are certain things that household practitioners can extrapolate out of these teachings. Now, there's the core path to enlightenment, as I've mentioned, but then there's these kind of higher teachings that are designed to help the ordained practitioners accomplish what it is that they're trying to accomplish, not just enlightenment like everyone is working towards, but also helping them to kind of better refine their conduct and how they interact in the world. Because the ordained practitioners and teachers like me were setting an example for students, were becoming a role model in a certain sense of the word that other people can observe our practice and how we function in the world. And this tells Tells them something about the teachings and the path to enlightenment and further helps an individual to develop their practice in order to get to enlightenment. So if a teacher like me or ordained practitioners were practicing lowly arts, it would actually make it much harder for everyone else in the world to actually get to enlightenment because we're practicing things that are actually uh, making the path to enlightenment very diluted and very difficult to see, making it very obscure. And maybe in some cases, instead of practicing right view and promoting the practice of right view, which is an important step on the Eightfold Path, by certain things that ordained practitioners or teachers might be doing, we could actually be doing something in our practice that is promoting wrong view. And many of the things that the Buddha is teaching as part of lowly arts that he's encouraging his ordained practitioners not to practice. He's sharing this as a way to ensure that the ordained practitioners are not practicing things that are encouraging things like wrong view. Now, whether a household practitioner chooses to do some of these things or not is up to them. But like I mentioned, if you look at what the Buddha is teaching to the ordained practitioners, there's lessons that you can extrapolate from it in order to strengthen your practice and develop your practice more fully. And if you're looking to be a teacher of these teachings, either as an ordained practitioner or even a household practitioner like what I do, it's really important that even though these teachings are set aside for the ordained practitioners, that you pay close attention to them so that you ensure that you learn them and practice them so that you can set a good example and be a good role model for the students who are choosing to learn from you. And then even if you're just choosing to be a household practitioner and you're not ever interested in doing any teaching whatsoever, there's still lessons in these particular teachings that you can extrapolate into your life and understand more about the path to enlightenment to more fully develop your practice. So this book on the lowly arts, I think is so important because it helps you to see the things that the Buddha is teaching to this higher level of teachings for ordained practitioners and teachers, but also you can extrapolate this for your own life. And the interesting thing that you're going to see here is that as you learn in this book, 
many of the things that the Buddha taught that we should not do as teachers or ordained practitioners, that they're actually being done quite extensively in Buddhist temples and all throughout the world because people aren't studying with the words of the Buddha. So as you study in these chapters of the book Lowly Arts, you might say, but hold on a second, there's monks at the temple down the street that actually do these things. And that's exactly why I share these teachings and that's exactly why the Buddha shared them. You'll see that they promote wrong view and because of that, it makes it really difficult for people that are coming together as a community to see the path to enlightenment clearly and actually attain enlightenment as long as ordained practitioners and or teachers like me might choose to practice these things. And when I think about people who are practicing these things like ordained practitioners or teachers, I'm not thinking of them as bad or wrong or unwholesome or anything like that. I'm just thinking that there's a lack of wisdom. There's a lack of understanding of what the Buddha taught. And when we go back to the original words of the Buddha, understanding what he taught and we understand why he taught it and how that promotes right view and allows people to readily progress on the path to enlightenment, then we don't judge these other people for what they're choosing to do or not do. We don't look down on them. We don't think that they're bad or wrong or unwholesome. We just understand it's a lack of wisdom on their part, and they're just not having access to these resources. But for our life and our life practice, as we gain this wisdom, we should be interested to understand it, to reflect on it, and then choose to practice it. And that's where you'll see the benefits and the results. So once again, thank you for joining for today's class, whether you're joining live or you're listening on one of the replays. This particular book, I think, is really, really interesting. I think all the books in the book series are super interesting, but this one particularly because it deals with a topic that is not really widely known in Buddhist communities. And it's a topic where a lot of Buddhist communities are actually doing the things that the Buddha is describing that we should not involve ourselves in. So this is an opportunity for you to be able to now learn these things and choose whether or not you're going to practice them or not practice them. I just noticed that my screen on the live stream changed a bit. Let me um, adjust that to get a better view for the people online. There we go. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just turn things over to all of you guys. We're going to forego meditation today in order to allow us time to really soak into this new book and really ensure that you guys have enough time to ask any questions that you like because it's a new topic. So the way that we're going to do our class is a student will actually read each individual chapter I will share teachings on that chapter and then open up to any questions that you might have on that specific chapter. You can put your questions into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can electronically raise your hand and ask any questions or follow-up questions directly. So I'll turn things over to all of you and specifically Miranda, who's our moderator for today. Um, yes, thank you, sir. Oh, there we go. Thank you, I was gonna ask you to switch the view a little bit okay uh chapter one what are the lowly arts <laughs> venerable sir whereas some ascetics and brahmins feeding on the food of the dedicated make their living by such base arts such wrong means of livelihood as palmistry divining by signs portents dreams body marks mouse gnawings fire oblations oblations from a ladle of husks rice powder rice grains, ghee or oil from the mouth or of blood, reading the fingertips, house and garden lore, skill and charms, ghost lore, earth house lore, snake lore, poison lore, rat lore, bird lore, crow lore, foretelling a person's lifespan, <clears throat> charms against arrows, knowledge of animals' cries, Whereas some ascetics and Brahmins make their living by such base arts as judging the marks of gems, sticks, clothes, swords, spears, arrows, weapons, women, men, boys, girls, male and female slaves, elephants, horses, buffaloes, bulls, cows, goats, rams, cocks, quail, iguanas, 
bamboo rats, tortoises, deer, whereas some ascetics and Brahmins make their living by such base arts as predicting the chiefs will march out, the chiefs will march back, our chiefs will advance and the other chiefs will retreat, our chiefs will win and the other chiefs will lose, the other chiefs will win and ours will lose, thus there will be victory for one side and defeat for another, Whereas some ascetics and Brahmins make their living by such base arts as predicting an eclipse of the moon, sun and moon will go on their proper course, will go astray, that a star will go on its proper course, will go astray, that there will be a shower of meteors, a blaze in the sky, an earthquake, thunder, a rising, setting, darkening, brightening of the moon, the sun, the stars, and such will be the outcome of these things. Whereas some ascetics and Brahmins make up their living by such base arts as predicting good or bad rainfall, a good or bad harvest, security, danger, disease, health or accounting, computing, calculating, poetic composition, philosophizes. Whereas some ascetics and Brahmins make their living by such base arts as arranging the giving and taking in marriage, engagements and divorces, declaring the time for saving and spending, bringing good or bad luck, procuring abortions, using spells to bind the tongue, ending the jaw, making the hands jerk, causing deafness, getting answers with a mirror, a girl medium, a heavenly being, worshiping the sun or great Brahma, breathing fire, invoking the goddess of luck. Whereas some ascetics and Brahmins, feeding on the word of, or the food of the dedicated, make their living by such base arts, such wrong means of livelihood as appeasing the heavenly beings and redeeming vows to them, making earth house spells, causing virility or impotence, preparing and consecrating building sites, giving ritual rinsings and bathings, making sacrifices, giving emetics, purges, expectorants and flemagogues, giving ear, eye, nose medicine, ointments and counter ointments, eye surgery, surgery, podiatry, using balms to counter the side effects of previous remedies. All right. Thank you, Miranda. <clears throat> so here in this part of the discourse, the Buddha is just laying out what are lowly arts. What you're going to see in the next discourse and others is he's going to share that he doesn't do these things. Because remember, during his lifetime, there were multiple teachers who were claiming that it was their teachings that lead to enlightenment. And there were communities of aesthetics that had given up worldly possessions and now taken up learning with these various teachers. The Buddha was just one of many teachers. And there's no outward characteristic that somebody can determine that this person's a Buddha. So there's not like a mark on the forehead or a certain mark on the ear that it's like, oh, this person's a Buddha. Everybody drop what you do and learn with this Buddha. That's not actually how it works in the world. Instead, during the lifetime of the Buddha, there were multiple people teaching various things. And the Buddha knew that it was his teachings that lead to enlightenment. And he was declaring what it takes in order to get to enlightenment. And certain things that he's declaring is what he's observing that's going on in the world and helping people understand that these things don't lead to enlightenment. And here what he's describing is all the various livelihoods of ways that aesthetics or Brahmin, which are Hindu priests, are earning money and making money. And by them doing all these things, that's what they're using in order to make money. Well, what the Buddha did is the Buddha actually didn't accept money for anything that he did. He only accepted food, water, clothing, shelter, and medical care. Essentially, that's all he really accepted, just things to sustain his life. But other teachers and other aesthetics and Brahmin who were learning from those teachers, they were doing all these different things like fortune telling and uh, accepting animals and growing animals and selling animals, uh, doing these uh, ghost lore and house things. Uh, here where they're talking about um, the chiefs marching out and marching back. This is like uh, warring and, you know, two different kingdoms warring and kind of betting or gambling who was going to win, who wasn't going to win. Here he's talking about kind of, you know, information about the weather and how... 
uh, people might look at, uh, you know, the sun and the moon. And he talks about the weather uh, with earthquakes and thunder and stuff like that. He talks about harvesting and different things. There's all these different things that he's talking about that people are using in order to make money and also be an aesthetic in getting to enlightenment and trying to share teachings in order to help others get to enlightenment. Well, if an individual is sharing teachings to help students get to enlightenment, and they're also making money on the side doing something else, then oftentimes their mind is going to be pulling towards those other activities rather than sharing the teachings with their students. If somebody has given up their life outside of sharing their teachings, then they're fully dedicated to the community that they're supporting. But if they're also doing something on the side, then their dedication is kind of split because they need to maybe uh, sell cars or sell something else on the side and have some kind of business in order to support them to share their teachings. And this might be something that someone does for a period of time as they transition from one livelihood to another livelihood to actually start sharing the teachings. But if somebody is trying to help others get to enlightenment and they've got this other activity on the side, their focus and their attention is split and their students oftentimes might have difficulty seeing, well, what is this person's real intention? They sell cars on the side and they're teaching how to get to enlightenment as well. And they're actually selling cars to some of their students that they're helping to get to enlightenment. So what is their real goal here? Are they actually trying to sell cars? Are they trying to help people get to enlightenment? It becomes very fuzzy for people's minds and they can't really see really clearly what the true intentions of this teacher are. So the Buddha is sharing ultimately when you see the next discourse that he doesn't do these things because he's trying to keep it very clear in the eyes of his students that all he's interested in is helping people get to enlightenment. That's his only goal. That's the goal of a Buddha is helping people get to enlightenment. They don't have any other goals whatsoever because they've extinguished all their cravings. They don't have any cravings that are pulling them in any one direction or another. They've extinguished all of those. The only goal, objective, or interest that a Buddha has is to share the teachings into the world that help countless people get to enlightenment. And then their teachings can be preserved after their death so that countless more people can get to enlightenment. So if somebody was practicing these things, it would be very fuzzy for their own mind because their mind would be split and their student's mind and their perception would also be very split about what is this person's real intention. The other aspect of the reason why the Buddha is going to share with you that he doesn't practice any of these lowly arts is because they, some of them actually promote wrong view where if we're doing the training on the path to enlightenment, helping people's minds come into the present moment, and we're training them to make wise decisions based on the present moment that lead to beneficial results. Well, if you're also teaching fortune telling or palm reading or some of these other things that you're gonna hear about in this book, that's really muddying the waters for the students that on one side, you're teaching this path to enlightenment to bring your mind into the present moment, but on another side, you're making money from fortune telling or reading people's palms or blessing their house or you know gambling on the weather and things like this. So this makes it very difficult for a student to be able to study with this teacher, this aesthetic, and be able to see clearly what is the path to enlightenment when they're promoting wrong view because part of what right view is is accepting responsibility for your own feelings making decisions based on the present moment and progressing through life making wise decisions well if we're doing some kind of livelihood like fortune telling and telling people what their future is going to be this is really detrimental and dangerous to a person's mind because if they know what their future is or they they think that they know what their future is because it may or may not even be true, then in the present moment, it's kind of difficult for them to make wise decisions about what may potentially they do now because their mind is focused on the future. 
So there's all kinds of difficulties when a aesthetic or Brahmin or a teacher chooses a livelihood outside of just sharing these teachings. It makes it very difficult for that teacher's mind because it's split between multiple things. And it makes it very difficult for the student's mind to be able to see clearly what are the intentions of this teacher and what are they truly working towards. And in some cases, these lowly arts are going to promote wrong view. And that's why the Buddha is sharing that he doesn't practice any of these lowly arts. That's what he's ultimately going to get to as he shares this. But as I mentioned in the opening, in the introduction, as you learn these lowly arts and what they are, you're going to see that there's a large majority of certain practitioners in the world, particularly ordained practitioners who do do these things. In fact, the temple where I teach upstairs above the classroom, they actually do this stuff. They do fortune telling and reading palms and things like this. That's their practice. That's what they choose to do. It doesn't affect me. Uh, there's lots and lots of people who come for this stuff and they actually pay money uh, in order to uh, get this stuff done but it's not what the Buddha actually taught. So as you learn this, feel free to ask questions about what any of these are and understand that your goal as a practitioner shouldn't be to have your palm read or to have fortune telling. Or if you see ordained practitioners who are doing these things, then you know that they're not practicing the teachings of the Buddha very closely. And you might consider whether it would be wise for you to actually learn from that ordained practitioner or not. Because if they're not understanding this uh, basic and core teaching that the Buddha shared with the ordained practitioners, it kind of leaves you thinking, well, what else don't they understand about the teachings of the Buddha? So if you're looking to study with a teacher that is going to share the path to enlightenment, I would suggest that you would look for a teacher who's dedicated to sharing their teachings and maybe even if they're doing something on the side you can see that they're actively working towards moving to a livelihood where they're only sharing these teachings and as they're sharing their teachings they're not doing any of these things because if a teacher is doing any of these things it's going to split their mind it's going to be hard for the students to understand what that teacher is up to and in a lot of cases it's going to be promoting wrong view so you can't be teaching right view on one side and making money from promoting wrong view on another side. This is not wise for a teacher to do. And in my suggestion, it would be unwise for a student to learn from somebody like that. And that's what the Buddha is ultimately going to share with you, that he doesn't do any of these things. And these are some of the reasons why. So let me see what questions you guys have about this chapter. Yes, sir. Donnie has his hand raised. Let's go to him for his question. Uh, thank you, Miranda. Uh, did you, on the fifth paragraph, uh, they were saying something about um, accounting, computing, calculating, poetic composition, philosophy. So does it mean that those people in accounting, IT, poets, and philosophers are doing wrong view? No, in this particular case, what he's saying is as an aesthetic, as a Brahmin, uh, he, that there's some aesthetics in Brahmin that do these things. And what you're going to get to is the Buddha chooses not to do these things because of his role as a Buddha and sharing the path to enlightenment. He's not going to do these things. But there's going to be household practitioners that do do these things. These particular things aren't wrong view to be able to do these things. But as a teacher who's sharing teachings into the world, if somebody was doing these things on the side, then once again, the perception of the students, it becomes very hard. It's like, hold on, are they selling me accounting services or are they teaching me the path to enlightenment? The mind becomes confused because there's different roles here. But in a household practitioner's uh, role, if they're an accountant, for example, they're not practicing wrong view, that's their choice. So remember that what he's sharing in this book about lowly arts, it's for ordained practitioners and it's for uh, teachers who are sharing these teachings. That if we try to split our time between multiple things, like if I was doing accounting on the side and I was teaching the path to enlightenment and then some of my students were also my clients for the accounting, People would get very confused about, well, what's David's real intentions? But because I don't do that, 
I would think that you guys have it very clear in your mind. David's only goal here is to help us get to enlightenment. That's the only thing he does. He doesn't do anything else but help us to get to enlightenment. That's his only goal whatsoever. And then as an accountant, if you're an accountant, then you're an accountant. And that's your goal is to help people with accounting. But that by itself isn't wrong view. It's your role. So remember that these teachings are for teachers and ordained practitioners. And in some cases, there's going to be teachings that you can extrapolate from these for your household life. But in this case, the ones that you're pointing out, those are completely fine for a household practitioner. But what I would suggest is a household practitioner who's doing something like fortune telling, right? Like up here in this paragraph. If a household practitioner is doing that, it's still not necessarily wrong livelihood for you to practice that as a household practitioner, but someone who deeply understands right view and that they're interested in seeing more and more beings get to enlightenment, I would suggest that a household practitioner wouldn't practice fortune telling. Even though this is a teaching for ordained practitioners and teachers, there's going to be teachings like this that you can extrapolate and say, aha, I see if I practice fortune telling, that's going to promote wrong view in the world. And as a household practitioner, even though it doesn't affect right livelihood, it still would be unwise for me to practice fortune telling, for example. So there's going to be some things in here that you can extrapolate for household life, but there's going to be some things that are just exclusively for ordained practitioners and teachers. So the one that you pointed out, Donnie, this one is just for ordained practitioners and teachers. I see. So I think the Buddha is trying to make a point. If it is an ordained practitioner, they should be focused only on one thing instead of having any sidelines. Exactly. Because it's going to be confusing because the whole, what you're going to see the Buddha talks about, and he starts talking about it down here, is he says, you know, one who's feeding on the food of the dedicated, right? So all these household practitioners, you guys included, you're making offerings to your teacher in order for your teacher to then be able to sustain their life and support you in getting to enlightenment. So if somebody's taking in donations and support from household practitioners, and then on the side, they're doing something to make money, it's like, hold on a second, your students and your community are supporting you in your life, but yet you're over here making money on something else. The Buddha is saying, essentially what you'll see in the next discourse, is he's saying he doesn't do that, that he's basically dedicated to supporting the people who are supporting him. So if you're feeding on the food of the dedicated, if you're accepting donations from the dedicated, those people who are dedicated to get to enlightenment, as an aesthetic or a Brahmin or a teacher, you should also be dedicated to helping those individuals get to enlightenment rather than having a side job over here. Because if their donations are helping you to sustain your life and you've got a side job, then it's just not really wise because uh, that support that you're getting from your students is supporting your life and your, and your ability to sustain your life, but you're then using that to make more money somewhere else. A person who's truly dedicated to sharing these teachings and helping people get to enlightenment, they would have already eliminated any craving, desire, attachment for money. They're going to need to have financial support and food and water and clothing and shelter and medical care and things like this, but they only need enough of that to sustain their life. That's not what their goal in life is. If they're sharing these teachings as an enlightened being, they shouldn't be chasing after money as well. So if somebody has, for example, come learn with me to get to enlightenment. You can get to enlightenment in three months by paying $10,000. You can get to enlightenment in one year by paying $3,000. You can get to enlightenment in two years by paying $1,000. Right away, it's like, hold on, this person's trying to make money. That's what their real goal is here. And what the Buddha set up his practice to be is all he's interested in is helping people get to enlightenment. And he understands that these dedicated people who are sharing offerings with him, he then needs to be dedicated to helping them as well and not have this side job over here doing something else. Um, thank you, thank sir. You, 
Yeah, you're welcome. And with that, Donnie, as a household practitioner, your role in life is very different, right? If you were doing accounting in real estate at the same time, okay, that's what you're doing, right? Because you're choosing to function in a role as a household practitioner. You're not guiding people to enlightenment. And you can do those things without being attached to money. You can pursue increased amounts of improvement in your life in helping your family to have more income by maybe doing an accounting job and real estate job as well. And you're not practicing wrong livelihood in that situation because you're not also doing a third thing, which is sharing the teachings to get to enlightenment. Yes, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, on YouTube, Brandon Haynes asks, what do you think is the cause of practitioners ignoring these teachings and practicing lowly arts? It's a lack of wisdom, Brandon. It's people that don't have access to these teachings. You know, what we typically think as people who grow up in a Christian culture is that every ordained practitioner must have these teachings. But that's not actually true. Because when we grew up in Christian culture, there's just one book. It's, it's a Bible. Actually, it's 72 books inside of one book. And it's in every hotel room pretty much that you travel to in a Christian environment like America. When I was growing up as a child, every hotel room that I stayed in had a Bible. And you would think that the Buddhist teachings would just be everywhere. But in reality, there are 45 large volumes of books that are like real thick. They're about six inches thick, four to six inches thick for each volume of book. And it costs about a thousand to two thousand dollars to be able to acquire a version of these books and those are very expensive for places like thailand to be able to have them in every single temple and even if those books do exist in a certain temple the likelihood of ordained practitioners choosing to actually seek those books out deeply investigate them deeply understand them and actually practice them is very rare i've been to over 200 temples in my lifetime and i've only ever been to one temple that is deeply practicing the words of the buddha that's less than one percent and this is the problem that we found ourselves in 2500 years after the death of the buddha which the buddha actually predicted he predicted that this exact thing would occur that his teachings would gradually decline over time he talked about the first 500 years after his death the teachings would be very bright and shining in the world but then from there on, they would gradually decline to the point that we are now. So while we think that every Buddhist ordained practitioner would have access to these teachings and would deeply practice them and heave the words of the Buddha and understand why that's he's teaching these things, <clears throat> it's actually not the case that most people have relied on the oral tradition of one person handing down knowledge from one person to the next to the next to the next and because people have relied on the oral tradition an oral tradition is very easy to be tainted and changed because it's just per based on person's memory sharing from one generation to the next and if there's craving anger and ignorance in the mind the mind is polluted it's lacking the ability to have clear thoughts and deep memory so as these teachings have been handed down in an oral tradition for 2500 years people have splintered off and created all these different traditions and all these different sects and in all these different temples they're learning different things. There's not just one centralized organization that is collecting up the teachings and then disseminating them out for all the different temples to learn and practice. Instead, each one of these temples function as an individual temple. And whatever the ordained practitioners are learning at a certain temple and whatever the household practitioners are learning at a certain temple is based on the wisdom of the master monk at that temple. So if that master monk is deeply practicing the words of the Buddha based on the original source text of the Pali Canon, like what you're studying here, then that temple is going to deeply understand the teachings and all the monks around that master monk and the household practitioners will be deeply learning and practicing. But if that master teacher hasn't deeply understood the teachings, then whatever they're sharing is based on what they learned over this generational knowledge in the oral tradition. So you'll see that communities of practitioners will kind of gather around a certain teacher and they're basically 
learning whatever it is that that teacher does themselves. So you guys are learning what I what I know from the words of the Buddha, and you guys have access to these teachings, but the average person doesn't. That's why this book series, the title is The Words of the Buddha, The Path to Enlightenment, Revealing the Hidden, because these teachings in a lot of ways are kind of hidden from society, not intentionally, but it's just that they're buried because they're 45 large volumes. They're in this really old language of Pali that not many people understand. And then the people that have translated them, in some cases, you have to pay in order to get the teachings. And this is why when I created this book series, I just give it away for free because I'm interested in seeing the wide community of the world, the entire international community, all of humanity to learn and practice these teachings. So that's why I just give these books away for free so that they can come into the world and they can shine in the world in the way that they did during the lifetime of the Buddha. Because right now, the average person doesn't even know where to go to get the teachings of the Buddha. Most people, if they're studying the Buddha's teachings, they might be studying the Dhammapada. They might understand the Dhammapada, but this isn't even the words of the Buddha. This is a scholarly work that is an interpretation from scholars of what they think the Buddha might have been teaching during his life. And they wrote this down about 1200 years after his death. And scholars typically aren't practitioners. So if a scholar is writing down what the teachings of the Buddha are, because they lack the practice of the teachings, they're also lacking the wisdom. That's where you really cultivate the true wisdom is through your practice. So the resources that have been available in the world up until now haven't been very vibrant and haven't been very strong and haven't been very accessible. People that are writing books about Buddhism, they're just writing whatever this oral tradition that they've learned from one person to the next, to the next, to the next. So when I started sharing these teachings, I was very interested in going back to the original teachings of the Buddha. So I put forth all this effort to cultivate these books and share them freely so that the wide audience of the entire international world can get access to them. But even now that I'm doing that, these teachings need to permeate in the world more and more so that people know that they're available. Not many people necessarily know that these are available or know that they should be studying the words of the Buddha. So these temples are oftentimes lacking the resources to be able to have these books. And even if they have them, they're oftentimes lacking the motivation and the enthusiasm and the eagerness to investigate them. And this is something that I'm working to improve where I'm helping temples to acquire access to these books. One of the temples that we're looking at to hold our retreat in the USA and Georgia, we've been, I've been talking to them for about five or six weeks and I've learned that they don't have access to these books. So I used some of the donations that the students give me to purchase books to send to this temple in Georgia. And whether or not we actually teach there or not during our retreat, I don't know yet, but at least this particular temple now has the words of the Buddha from this book series. And this is the way that through us practicing generosity and practicing merit, we can now use these resources that we've cultivated and created in our community and now share them with the world in a way that more and more people can get access to them. So that's the reason why, Brandon, it's, it's all impermanence, it's a lack of motivation, it's a lack of resources. Yes, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. This last part of this last section, it seems is more talking about practicing medicine. And I'm sure the medicine of the time during Gautama Buddha's lifetime was much more Uh, like mystical based, probably a lot of it, but for someone who would have ordained, who maybe had practiced medicine before, doing this without charging money for it, would that still kind of count as wrong livelihood or could they do that? Is it just the charging money for these services that would have made it wrong livelihood, sir? It's the charging of money for these things because that's where the students can't see the real intention behind what's really going on here. But in reality, as an ordained practitioner, you're supposed to leave all of these things behind. Because 
if you are feeding on the food of the dedicated, what they're doing is your students are making you offerings to create kind of like a womb for this individual to now live within this womb that you don't have a career, you don't have a house, you don't have uh, all these worldly pursuits. Instead, you're feeding on the food of the dedicated in order to give you the time to investigate the teachings so that you can get closer and closer to enlightenment as a teacher. If a teacher can get closer and closer to enlightenment through the community supporting them and not having to dedicate time, effort, energy, and resources to a career, like doing eye surgery or podiatry or things like this, by them not splitting their time and doing these other activities, they can get super dedicated into getting to enlightenment, which is ultimately going to help the household practitioners who are supporting you. Whereas if you're splitting your time between, yeah, I'll do a little bit of this path to enlightenment stuff, but I'm still going to be attached to my career as an eye surgeon, then they're still putting time, effort, energy, and resources into that. And they're not really letting that go in order to deeply develop their practice. So that then, as they develop their practice, they have the wisdom to offer to the dedicated people who are supporting you. So if a person sets up as a teacher, they should get to a point where they've let go of all their worldly pursuits and they're only interested in sharing the teachings that lead to enlightenment. And this is a mutual support between the students and the teachers. And I think that later in this book, there's a chapter like that where the Buddha talks about this mutual support between students and the teachers. If it's not in this book, it's definitely in others, but I think it's in this one that as long as somebody's feeding on the food of the dedicated, as long as someone's taking in donations and these people are trying to get to enlightenment, then that's being done to provide this bubble or this womb for this teacher to now dedicate their time to sharing their teachings. And even if they're doing these uh, surgeries and things that they've been trained to do in the past, they're now splitting their time and they're not really focused on what the real goal of supporting people to get to enlightenment should be. Yes, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, it appears there are no other questions at this time, sir. All right. So now we're at chapter two. Yes, sir. Let's go to Donnie to read chapter two. One of the things that we thank can... You, Bavenda. Uh, one of the things that we can do here is uh, this is a repeat here where what we just talked about <clears throat> in chapter one the Buddha is just repeating each one of these paragraphs. And then he's basically oh. just saying that uh, this last line. So, Donnie, feel free that if you need to, you can skip over some of this. You're welcome to read the whole thing if you like. But he, it's just the same thing that we just read. Oh, okay. Um, the whole thing is a repeat of the previous chapter? E everything here is a repeat. And then what is being added to it is this last part where the Buddha says he, uh, re he refrains from doing these things. I see. Okay. The aesthetic Gautama refrains from such base arts. So uh, from the previous chapter uh, where the shared some base art, the, the aesthetic Gautama refrains from such base arts and wrong means of livelihood. Thus, the whirling would praise the Tathagata. And um, from the previous chapter as well, the aesthetic Gautama refrains from such base arts. And thus, the whirling would praise the Tathagata. And for the other two few chapters, uh, the aesthetic Gautama refrains from such base art. Thus, the whirling would praise the Tathagata. And um, yep, I think that's it. Yeah, these are all the same so, exact yeah, ones. Yeah, exactly the same thing. Let's see. This uh, one and the, the last same. one would be, it is monks for such basic minor matters of moral practice that the whirling would praise the Tathagata. Yeah, so here, one of the ways that he teaches is he doesn't say like, thou shall not perform eye surgery, right? This is like ordering somebody or controlling somebody of what to do and what not to do. Instead, 
he's functioning as an enlightened being. He's not going to try to control what other people do. He's not even going to order or dictate what they should or shouldn't do. But people observing him in his life, they could see his mind was peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. They could see that he was very polite, very kind, very friendly, very respectful, very dedicated to helping them on the path to enlightenment. So they admired him as the way that he was practicing because his mind was very peaceful and very joyful. So what he's doing here, instead of saying, thou shall not do this, instead what he's saying is, okay, there's some aesthetic in Brahmin, who are feeding on the food of the dedicated and they make their li- they they make their living by such base arts and such means of livelihood as and then he shares what that is he shares what they're doing right he's like they're doing these things here's the things that they're doing and then he says the aesthetic gotama refrains from such base arts and wrong means of livelihood this is a way of not gossiping about somebody, not talking down to somebody, not saying that you're wrong and I'm right. He's just saying, hey, there's some people who do these things, but I choose not to do them. I'm I'm choosing not to do them. And then the students who are learning from the Buddha, if they're aspiring to attain the same mental state as the Buddha, then they're going to be like, okay, well, if the Buddha doesn't do those things, then maybe I shouldn't do them either. So this is a way of a Buddha is able to teach without slandering somebody, without gossiping about somebody, without talking down to somebody, without being judgmental about what other people are doing. Because if other people are choosing to do eye surgery or fortune telling, and that's what they're choosing to make their livelihood at, and they think that they're enlightened, then the Buddha is saying, okay, well, this is what they're doing, but I'm choosing not to do that. And because I'm choosing not to do that, he's saying the worldling would praise the Tathagata. So while he's conducting his life, he knows that the household practitioners are praising him and saying, thank you so much. Uh, At that time, they called him aesthetic Gotama or master teacher Gotama. Thank you, Master Teacher Gotama, for sharing these teachings with us. Thank you for being so dedicated to come to our village, to come to our house, to spend time with us over the last two weeks. And all you've done is dedicated your time to helping us learn these teachings. Thank you so much for your dedication. So he wasn't at their house for two weeks teaching them and then on the side doing eye surgery too. He was just dedicated to sharing these teachings. So the household practitioners would praise him for this. And that's what he's sharing. He's just sharing with his students of what he chooses to practice and what he's choosing not to practice and that he's refraining from doing these things. And because he's refraining from doing those things, the household practitioners are choosing to praise him for that. And the message that he's sending here is, hey students, hey aesthetics, if you guys are interested in experiencing this mental state that I'm experiencing, and you're interested in helping others to get to enlightenment, then you might consider eliminating these things from your practice too. And this is a way for him to teach that without trying to dictate to people what to do or control them what to do. He's sharing what he does. And then if somebody aspires to do those same things, they can choose to do that or not. It's up to them. He's not issuing a bunch of rules or mandates or something like that. He's just sharing what he chooses to do. And then at the end here, he says, it is monks for such basic minor matters of moral practice that the worldling would praise the Tadagata. So he's not seeing this as like, he's so high above everybody else. He's seeing this as just a basic minor moral practice that if I'm gonna feed on the food of the dedicated, if I'm going to accept donations from a community of people who are interested in getting to enlightenment, then I'm gonna also be dedicated to helping them get to enlightenment. And to him, this is a very basic minor matter of letting go of any worldly pursuits of a career and choosing to dedicate his time, effort, energy, and resources to helping people get to enlightenment. And this is what a Buddha is going to do. And he worked to help the aesthetics to get to enlightenment and then also focus their mind 
on helping others get to enlightenment because that's how the teachings are shared. Where once again, if somebody's splitting their time where they're sharing the teachings to get to enlightenment and doing something else, it makes it very muddy for people to be able to see that that person is truly dedicated to helping them get to enlightenment. And here the Buddha is saying, this is a very basic minor thing as part of his moral practice that he doesn't practice these other things. And if somebody else chooses to do it, it's up to them, but he's choosing not to do it. Do you guys have questions on this chapter? Um, yes, sir. I had a question. It's more from your explanation of this teaching than from the teaching itself. Something like being a food server, especially here in the U.S., really anywhere that you're going to be serving food, they serve meat, they serve coffee, sodas that have caffeine. Is this still considered right livelihood, or would that be wrong livelihood at that point, sir? Yeah, so the wrong livelihood for household practitioners is five trades, which is business in weapons, business in living beings, business in meats, business in substances that cause heedlessness, and business in weapon or business in poisons. So weapons, living beings, meat, substances that cause heedlessness, and poisons, because these are causing harm in the world. And that's the basis of wrong livelihood. But then there's another teaching that you're going to see in this book that the Buddha expands upon right livelihood. And he explains that in order to get to right livelihood, you need to have a livelihood that isn't affected by craving anger and ignorance. That if somebody was in a livelihood just purely to make money, and that's the only thing they care about, they only care about making money, then that's not a right livelihood for them because that person's going to be pursuing gain with gain. They're going to be motivated by just making money. They're not interested in providing a service that's really helping humanity and helping people. Their only care is about money. And the Buddha is saying that this is a livelihood that is affected by the taints or the pollutions of mind or the 10 fetters. So in order to get to right livelihood, a person needs to not practice the five wrong livelihoods and they also need to ensure that their livelihood is purified, that it's not affected by the 10 fetters. And this is where you get to a point where the job that you're doing, it doesn't even feel like work, that you just enjoy it so much that you would almost do it for free if you could, um, because you just enjoy it so much and you just enjoy providing this service or this product to people. And that's how you know that you're not even feeling like you're going to work. You're just enjoying the activity that you're work actually is an extension of what you do as a practitioner on a day-to-day -day basis. But we'll talk about that more when we get to that chapter. But I just would like to give you guys that background that there's more to right livelihood than just what I've taught in the group learning program. The group learning program is one layer of understanding of right livelihood. And then there's these higher teachings of right livelihood that involve not being affected by the pollutions of the mind. Well, if somebody was a food server and they were serving meat, they're actually having business in meat. And that's just where we are right now in our society and in our humanity is that these teachings don't really shine in the world the way that they can as we transition from a humanity that is lacking wisdom and misunderstanding what it takes to lead a better life we have been doing things like selling meat and we've been selling weapons and we've been selling living beings and we've been selling substances that cause heedlessness and we've been selling poisons and things like this. So people might be involved in certain livelihoods now where they're doing those things and that might be where they're at in their practice. But in order to fully get to a purified livelihood, they would need to eliminate those five wrong livelihoods and also eliminate the effect of pollutions of mind in their livelihood. And this is a gradual progression that they might not be there today. They might be doing a job as part of uh, being a food server or a cashier at a grocery store. They're participating in the selling of meat. And yes, this is a wrong livelihood, but it doesn't mean they need to rush out and go change their occupation right away. 
But instead, as they dial in the Eightfold Path in each one of those steps more and more closely, they might choose to focus in on livelihood at some point and might choose to move on into another livelihood. And that can be the way that they transition their practice. But then as more and more of the world understands these teachings and there isn't meat being sold in the world, it'll be a lot easier for practitioners to have a job like a food server and be practicing right livelihood or have a job at a grocery store as a cashier and be practicing right livelihood because they're not actually uh, selling meat. But right now, because the world isn't fully aware of these teachings, it's more challenging to kind of seek out a livelihood that doesn't include these things. So while food serving itself isn't a wrong livelihood, if it involves the selling of meat, it is part of right wrong livelihood. And somebody could actively work to purify that and improve that. But then as the world improves as a whole, food servers won't be serving meat if the entire world was learning and practicing these teachings to the point where meat isn't being sold anymore because nobody else is, is killing animals and selling meat. But we're a long ways off from that, multiple generations from away from that. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, it does not appear we have any other questions at this time. All right. Oh, and there's the wrong livelihoods right there that I was just talking about. Oh, I got them in order. Perfect. All right, so here's chapter three. Yes, sir. A monk who is perfected in morality, a monk refrains from such base arts and wrong means of livelihood. Venerable sir, whereas some ascetics and Brahmins, feeding on the food of the dedicated, make their living by such base arts, such wrong means of livelihood as palmistry, divining by signs, portents, dreams, body marks, mouse gnawings, fire ablations, ablations from a ladle, husks, rice powder, rice grains, gear oil from the mouth or of blood, reading the fingertips, house and garden lore, skill and charms, ghost lore, earth house lore, snake lore, poison lore, rat lore, bird lore, crow lore, foretelling a person's lifespan, charms against arrows, knowledge of animals cries. A monk refrains from such base arts and wrong means of livelihood. Thus he is perfected in morality. Can I pause you there for a second, Miranda? Yes, sir. I'm going to teach something after each paragraph that you read, uh, because I think this will help clarify something that Donnie was asking about. So these particular livelihoods that the Buddha is talking about here, these would be wrong livelihoods for an ordained practitioner or for a teacher. But if a household practitioner were choosing to do any of these things, it's not a wrong livelihood in terms of it's uh, not one of those five trades that he talked about. However, for a household practitioner who deeply understands right view and isn't interested in promoting wrong view in the world, they might choose to not do these things. But in, on their core and on their face value, they're not a wrong livelihood. But as I mentioned, someone who is interested in only promoting right view, they might choose to not do these things. So I'm going to do that with each paragraph so that you guys understand the difference. Okay, that's fine, sir. Whereas some ascetics and Brahmins make their living by such base arts as judging the marks of gems, sticks, clothes, swords, spears, arrows, weapons, women, men, boys, girls, male and female slaves, elephants, horses, buffaloes, bulls, cows, goats, rams, cocks, quail, iguanas, bamboo rats, tortoises, deer. A monk refrains from such base arts and wrong means of livelihood. Thus he is perfected in morality. Okay, so these livelihoods uh, here are all wrong livelihoods for an ordained practitioner or for a teacher. But for a household practitioner, if they were focused on marks of gems, sticks, and clothes, 
this isn't a wrong livelihood for a household practitioner and it also doesn't promote wrong view so there's no harm in a household practitioner focusing on gems sticks and clothes however for a household practitioner to sell swords spears arrows or weapons this is going to be wrong livelihood for everybody and likewise if they were selling w women men boys girls male female slaves this is also wrong livelihood for everyone and if they were to sell these animals this is wrong livelihood for everyone because we're selling living beings so that's the uniqueness here so anything from here down swords all the way to deer this is wrong livelihood for everyone uh, because it involves selling of weapons selling of living beings but these three right here wouldn't be a wrong livelihood and they don't promote wrong view either. Whereas some ascetics and Brahmins make their living by such base arts as predicting the chiefs will march out, the chiefs will march back, our chiefs will advance and the other chiefs will retreat, our chiefs will win and the other chiefs will lose, the other chiefs will win and ours will lose. Thus there will be victory for one side and defeat for the other. A monk refrains from such base arts and wrong means of livelihood. Thus he is perfected in morality. Okay, so these here, these are wrong livelihood for all ordained practitioners and for teachers. With uh, household practitioners, what the Buddha is talking about here is gambling on teams that are competing with each other. Here it's fighting and warring where now we have teams that are like sports teams and things like this the gambling that the buddha taught he didn't teach it as part of wrong livelihood but he taught it as part of his other teachings that if you gamble that this is going to lead to craving in the mind so even though this isn't part of wrong livelihood for a household practitioner to uh, have gambling for example it is part of your wrong practice or wrong action in terms of if you are gambling it's going to lead to craving in the mind and you're going to find that you're going to have difficulties in terms of having financial support for your family and taking care of your basic necessities so it doesn't deal so much with household practitioners livelihood it deals more with your way of practice that if you're gambling or you're supporting gambling through your livelihood then you're promoting the uh, craving desire attachment in the community and this is going to result in harmful uh, conduct in the world that as long as you're doing some kind of livelihood that is a rising craving in the mind it's going to promote uh, difficulties and struggles in your community and you're going to experience the results of that whereas some ascetics and brahmins make their living by such base arts as predicting an eclipse of the moon the sun a star that the sun and moon will go on their proper course will go astray that a star will go on its proper course will go astray that there will be a shower of meteors a blaze in the sky an earthquake thunder a rising setting darkening brightening of the moon the sun the stars and such will be the outcome of these things a monk refrains from such base arts and wrong means of livelihood thus he is perfected in morality okay so once again for ordained practitioners and for teachers this would be a wrong livelihood because we're not dedicated to sharing the teachings of the buddha which is what a teacher is setting up to do or an ordained practitioner is setting up to do but for a household practitioner we need these things we need a meteorologist to tell us that there's a storm coming or that there's a meteor shower or that there's a potential earthquake or things like this there's astronomers and meteorologists that base their livelihood off of this and this is helpful to humanity because we can use that information to make decisions to maintain our safety for ourselves and our family and our possessions so this is one of those ones where it any Thing outside of sharing the teachings of the Buddha for an aesthetic or for a teacher would be a wrong livelihood but for a household practitioner these aren't going to be a wrong livelihood because they're actually beneficial to humanity 
Whereas some ascetics and Brahmins make their living by such base arts as predicting good or bad rainfall, a good or bad harvest, security, danger, disease, health, or accounting, computing, calculating, poetic composition, philosophizing. A monk refrains from such base arts and wrong means of livelihood, thus he is perfected in morality. Okay, this is the same as the last paragraph, that for ordained practitioners and teachers, we wouldn't do these things, but for a household practitioner, these are needed as part of society and ensuring that there's these skills that are available in the community in order to allow us to be able to uh, know whether there's going to be good or bad rainfall and what crops should we actually plant in our community. You know, is there going to be a good or bad harvest? You know, the security and danger, uh, health and disease, accounting, computing, calculating, poetic composition and philosophizing. These are all things that are beneficial. So household practitioners will potentially do those things and they're completely practicing right livelihood in terms of the five wrong livelihoods. And then as long as these things aren't being done out of craving, anger and ignorance, then they're not being affected by the pollution of the mind. So these are things that household practitioners may choose to do, and it's benefiting humanity. Whereas some ascetics and Brahmins make their living by such base arts as arranging the giving and taking in marriage, engagements and divorces, declaring the time for saving and spending, bringing good or bad luck, procuring abortions, using spells to bind the tongue, binding the jaw, making the hands jerk, causing deafness, getting answers with a mirror, a girl medium, a heavenly being, worshiping the sun or great Brahma, breathing fire, invoking the goddess of love. A monk refrains from such base arts and wrong means of livelihood. Thus he is perfected in morality. Okay, so this is a more diverse list that we need to parse out. So arranging the giving and taking of marriage this would be like a ordained practitioner who's saying, oh, you would be good with this person and you should come together and marry. And now because of their position as an ordained practitioner, the people believe it and they haven't really made the decision for themselves. But instead, this person is trying to control who gets married and who doesn't and who gets married to who. This would be unwise for anybody, an ordained practitioner, a teacher, or even a household practitioner. That would be unwise to get involved in people's decision of who to marry uh, and who not to marry. Um, getting people engaged, um, you know, there's going to be people who sell rings to help people get engaged. So they're just selling the ring or the product. They're not actually creating the engagement themselves. But as an ordained practitioner or teacher, we wouldn't do that. Same thing with divorces. There's going to be people who are involved in the household life of helping people to get divorces, not telling them that they should or shouldn't get one, but maybe like a lawyer that's helping to navigate the legal system for a divorce. But an ordained practitioner or teacher wouldn't do that. The choice of whether people choose to get engaged or divorced is up to the individual person, not up to the teacher or the uh, the, the ordained practitioner. We might give you advice of, oh, that relationship looks very challenging. It looks like it's going to be difficult. If you're going to be with this person, you guys are going to probably need to sort this part of your relationship out. But we shouldn't be in a position of absolutely telling somebody to marry or divorce or something like that. Declaring the time for saving and spending. Once again, there's going to be governments and there's going to be financial advisors who are going to need to do this in the household life. But as an ordained or practitioner or a teacher, we wouldn't do that. Bringing good luck or bad luck, there's no such thing as good luck or bad luck. So if we're promoting that as an ordained practitioner or a teacher, it's causing harm in the world. And the same thing for a household practitioner. While it's not a wrong livelihood, it is promoting wrong view. Uh, procuring abortions, this would actually be part of wrong livelihood for everyone. Uh, I know that in some communities, abortion is a political issue. For me, it's not a political issue. Uh, whether it's legal to get an abortion or illegal to get an abortion, that's for lawmakers and elected officials and people who vote to make those decisions. 
but in terms of practicing teachings that are going to help you get to enlightenment, then you would consider whether or not getting an abortion would be wise for you or not. And there are some situations where it might make sense for you to get an abortion. And that's something that is going to need to, someone's going to need to have the freedom to be able to make that choice for themselves, not based on what I would share, because it's not an all or nothing. It's not like everybody shouldn't get an abortion. Everybody should get an abortion. There are certain situations where people may need to get an abortion, and that's their personal choice. But in terms of someone who's procuring an abortion for another person, this is contributing to the death of a living being, even though it's in the womb, and it would uh, cause difficulties in that person's life as a livelihood if they're choosing to do that because it's business and living beings. And in terms of the first precept of killing living beings, it would be problematic for them. They might actually experience discontentedness and problems in their life as a result of that. So whether it's legal or illegal is up to other people. What I'm sharing here is that it would be a wrong livelihood for an ordained practitioner and a teacher. And even for a household practitioner to do this, it would be considered a wrong livelihood. And this is why people tend to have a lot of difficulties who are participating in abortions. They tend to come up against a lot of aggression and hostility in the community because of that. Using spells to bind the tongue, bind the jaw, all of these spells that the Buddha is talking about here, this is... Um, in getting answers from the mirror, a girl medium, uh, interacting with heavenly beings. This, of course, is wrong livelihood for an ordained practitioner and a teacher. For a household practitioner, uh, this isn't necessarily a wrong livelihood in terms of the five trades, but this is very harmful in the world if these things are actually able to get done because it promotes wrong view and it promotes uh, problems in the community of doing these things. Uh, worshiping the sun uh, and worshiping God. For a household, or I'm sorry, for a ordained practitioner or a teacher, we're not going to teach any worship of anything because worshiping isn't what's going to lead to enlightenment. But that doesn't mean that somebody can't worship or that they shouldn't worship. If someone chooses to worship God, that's completely fine. They can do that. But they need to understand that through that worship of God, it's not going to produce enlightenment for them because God isn't the one who's granting you the enlightenment. So if someone's choosing to worship God or they're choosing to have an occupation like a priest, like a Catholic priest or a Christian priest, they're not performing wrong livelihood. They're just uh, in helping people to understand how to worship God. But if somebody believes that worshiping God is going to produce some kind of benefit in terms of getting to enlightenment, then they're not understanding craving anger and ignorance or the unknowing of true reality, that it's the cultivation of wisdom that improves your mind to make wise decisions that leads to improved outcomes in your life. By you cultivating wisdom and making wiser choices in your life, that's what leads to improved results. You can worship God all day long if you like. Um, that's not causing any harm. But when you think that worshiping God is going to improve your decision making and make you a richer person, a kinder person, a more loving person, that's not how that's going to happen. It has to happen through your wisdom and training your mind. So if someone chooses to worship God or chooses to have an occupation of doing that, as a household practitioner, then that's completely fine and up to them to be able to do that. As long as they understand that they can promote right view that, okay, I'm going to teach you how to worship God, but maintain right view that God isn't the one who's going to grant you wishes as part of your worship. And then breathing fire, invoking the goddess of luck, again, for ordained practitioners and teachers, all of these things are going to be wrong livelihood. For a household practitioner, if there's a performance where they're spitting fire and things like this, okay, that's their entertainment. That's not a wrong livelihood. Uh, invoking the goddess of luck, there's no such thing as a goddess of luck. If somebody's choosing to do this, uh, they're leading people down the path of wrong view, and it would be unwise to do that. 
All right, so the next paragraph. Whereas some ascetics and Brahmins, feeding on the food of the dedicated, make their living by such base arts, such wrong means of livelihood as appeasing the heavenly beings and redeeming vows to them, making earth house spells, causing virility or impotence, preparing and consecrating building sites, giving ritual rinsings and bathings, making sacrifices, giving emetics, purges, expectorants, and phlegmogogues, giving ear, eye, nose medicine, ointments and counter ointments, eye surgery, surgery, podiatry, using balms to counter the side effects of previous remedies, among refrains from such base arts and wrong means of livelihood, thus he is perfected in morality. Okay, so again, all ordained practitioners and teachers, these would be wrong livelihoods. But the way that this breaks down is these first several, which goes up to, where is it? Right here. These are all like rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship, essentially. This is going to be a wrong livelihood for ordained practitioners and uh, teachers. For household practitioners, it doesn't uh, affect the five wrong livelihoods that the Buddha taught. However, it promotes wrong uh, view in uh, the community. And somebody who's deeply practicing these teachings wouldn't be interested in promoting wrong view. These others here, this is medical uh, care. Again, an ordained practitioner teacher wouldn't do these things, but a household practitioner is gonna need to do these things. These are things that are offered in the community for a purpose. They're helping us to maintain our health. So those things are going to be needed and they're not a wrong livelihood. And then, sir, that monk who is perfected in morality sees no danger from any side owing to his being restrained by morality. Just as a duly anointed Katya king having conquered his enemies, by that very fact sees no danger from any side. So the monk, on account of his morality, sees no danger anywhere. He experiences in himself the blameless bliss that comes from maintaining this noble morality. In this way, sir, he is perfected in morality. All right, so what the Buddha is essentially saying here is that as an ordained practitioner and a teacher, if you're choosing to not do any of these things, then there's no danger that's going to come to you. There's no problem that's going to come to you. You're going to be able to focus your livelihood on developing your own practice to get to enlightenment and share these teachings with others. That when you do these as an ordained practitioner or teacher, <clears throat> then it makes it very cloudy for you to be able to focus on learning and practicing and sharing teachings. And it makes it very cloudy for your students to understand what is it that you're truly doing. So, if you're interested in having a livelihood as an ordained practitioner or a teacher, you would refrain from these wrong means of livelihood that the Buddha is explaining. And by doing so, you perfect your morality and that your community of students will be able to more deeply see what your intentions truly are, which is to share these teachings with them to help them get to enlightenment. And therefore, you're going to have more support in your community. Whereas if you're splitting your time between multiple things, sharing some teachings on the path to enlightenment, but doing these other things, your community members are not going to be as supportive of you because you're not being as supportive to them. Why would they be dedicated to helping you if you're not dedicated to helping them? This is the natural law of gamma. Whatever you put out is what's going to come back to you. So as an ordained practitioner and teacher, if you're dedicated to helping your students, then your students will be dedicated to helping you. And that's where the gamma comes about. So the Buddha is explaining that this last paragraph, that you will have a very successful livelihood as an aesthetic and as a teacher if you choose to purify and perfect your morality in this way by choosing not to do these things. Questions on this chapter? It does not appear there are any questions at this time, sir. All right. So let's go to chapter four. Yes, sir. Let's go to Donnie to read chapter four, please. Thank you, Miranda. The various kinds of pointless talk. Monks, do not engage in the various kinds of pointless talk. That is, talk about kings, thieves, and ministers of state, talk about armies, dangers, and wars, talk about food, drink, garments, and bits. 
talk about gardens and sands, talk about relations, vehicles, villages, towns, cities and countries, talk about women, I talk about heroes, street talk, I talk about the well, talk about those departed in days gone by, rambling chit chat speculation about the world and about the sea, talk about becoming this or that, for what reason? Because monks, this talk is unbeneficial, irrelevant to the fundamentals of the holy life, and does not lead to fading away of strong feelings, to freedom from strong feelings, to illumination, to peace, to direct knowledge, experience, to enlightenment, to nibbana. All right, thank you, Donnie. So here, once again, the Buddha is preparing the ordained practitioners of how to function in the world in a certain way that they're not creating situations where people can become discontent and then those aesthetics find it difficult to share teachings with students because the unenlightened mind is attached to many different things. And as a teacher, if you're talking about some of these things, a student can get discontent based on what it is that you're talking about. We know that the student is causing their own discontentedness, but as a teacher, if you're choosing to talk about kings now let's just say pol politics right if somebody was to talk about presidents and vice presidents and senators and different things if i was doing that as a teacher and i was talking about politics there's going to be some students who agree with me and some some students who disagree with me and therefore i can only teach the students who agree with me because the other students are going to be discontent there's no way i'm going to study with that guy because he doesn't like the same president that i like or the same senator that i like so as a teacher, as an ordained practitioner who's sharing these teachings with a wide audience of people, the Buddha is helping us to understand as teachers, how can you best talk and conduct yourself in the world to ensure that you're able to help the widest audience of people? Whereas if you're talking about politics, we'll say that instead of kings. If we're talking about crimes, which the Buddha is talking about here, thieves, if there are certain criminal cases in the public eye, and I was to take sides about one side or the other, then some people agree with me, some people don't. And that means those people who don't agree with me are probably gonna get discontent. They're gonna associate it with me causing their discontentedness, and they're gonna to choose to not learn these teachings. So it's hindering people from learning if an aesthetic or a Brahmin or a teacher, an ordained practitioner, talks about kings, thieves, and ministers of state, which is essentially politics and crime that's in the public eye. Same thing about talks of armies and dangers and wars and all of these other things. These are just opportunities for people to get discontent. If we were to talk about villages, towns, cities, or countries, if I was to bash the USA or bash the UK or bash uh, 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 Australia or something like this or talk really harsh about China or Russia or Japan people in those countries that are identifying with I am American or I am Australian or I am Japanese they're going to be very discontent because of their personal existence view they're going to attribute that to me because of my gossip and my slander and I'm not practicing in a way that opens up these teachings to a wide audience of people so the Buddha is guiding us ordained practitioners and us teachers to see that by us talking about these things, it's going to cause complications in the community because of our conduct of choosing to talk about things other than what leads to enlightenment. This last paragraph that he's teaching about here, he's essentially focusing us on talking about things that are related to the path to enlightenment. That's the only thing the Buddha talked about. From the time that he got to enlightenment until the time that he died, he shared teachings that lead to enlightenment. He didn't just chit chat or have rambling talk. So this is very wise for an ordained practitioner and a teacher. Additionally, what you can extrapolate from this as a household practitioner is that it might be wise for you also to practice something like this. If you're in a work environment and you're talking about politics, 
there's going to be certain coworkers that agree with you and there's going to be certain coworkers who disagree with you and it's going to make it very difficult for you to work in that environment when you're expressing your views and opinions about certain politics and people agree with you and some people don't people are going to have hatred and people are going to have anger towards you and this is going to make it difficult for you to function in a work environment where you're talking about politics for example now, there's going to be some household practitioners that that's their whole job. They are a politician or they might be a lobbyist in politics or they might be otherwise somehow connected to the political field. You know, that's their livelihood and that's what they're choosing to do. And there's going to be people that need to do those things. But in terms of you and your practice, depending on what your role is and what livelihood you're choosing, you might choose to not talk about politics because you know how aggressive people can get because of their craving. They can get very angry and very hostile related to talking about politics. The same things is that it would be wise for you to not talk about certain villages or towns or cities or countries, particularly in a negative way. I mean, if you talk in a positive way, OK, people aren't going to get discontent typically about that unless they get pleasant feelings as a result of that. Same thing with these vehicles and things like that. If you're you know, bashing Lamborghinis or Mercedes and somebody happens to be driving a Mercedes that's in your office and you're talking bad about these cars, it's going to make it difficult in your relationships. So the Buddha is giving guidance here for ordained practitioners and teachers to make it so that we don't talk about things that our students and our community is going to find problems with. And then it's going to have them push away from the teachings because of aversion. But also there's things in here that you might choose to say, you know, I shouldn't have rambling chit chat either. Even as a household practitioner, that would be unwise for me. Or what's another one? Talk about women and talk about heroes, right? If you're at the office talking about men or women or sexual things going on in a uh, in your private life, that would be kind of unwise of you. So you can extrapolate what the Buddha is saying here, understanding that he's sharing it in order to help ordained practitioners and teachers to not cause difficulties in their community of people who are learning from them. But you can also use these to your benefit in, in your work environment, in your personal life, in your community, in your neighborhood. It would be wise for you to practice these same things as well. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? Yes, sir. It seems that as a teacher, we do have to talk a bit about like food, drink, garments, and beds because of being vegetarian, vegan, being part of the path for many practitioners. Um, drink, not ingesting substances that cause heedlessness through caffeine and alcohol garments and beds, not promoting ego, losing that that self image that we tend to try to project onto the world. But what does this mean about not talking about those things when really as a teacher, we kind of we would have to, sir? Yeah, so it's key to see this part here, this various kinds of pointless talk where we were just chit-chatting like, you know, Miranda, those chocolate donuts are just amazing. I can't imagine not eating chocolate donuts. Oh my goodness, I just adore chocolate donuts. Where are all the chocolate donuts, right? This would be pointless talk. But if there's a purpose behind our talk where I say, you know, Miranda, I choose not to drink coffee because of the caffeine, and I notice with caffeine, it elevates the excitement in the mind, and I choose to not drink caffeine any longer. Now there's a purpose behind us talking about it. It's not pointless. Okay, yes, I see the, uh, the difference there, sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, it does not appear there are any other questions at this time, sir. All right, so we'll go to the next chapter, which is chapter five. <laughs> The ascetic Gautama refrained from pointless talk. Whereas some ascetics and Rahmans, feeding on the food of the dedicated, remain addicted to such distasteful conversation as about kings, thieves, and ministers of state, talk about armies, dangers, and wars, talk about food, drink, garments, and beds, talk about garlands and scents, 
talk about relations, vehicles, villages, towns, cities, and countries, talk about women and talk about heroes, street talk and talk by the well, talk about those departed in days gone by, rambling chit chat, speculation about the world and about the sea, talk about becoming this or that, the ascetic Gautama refrains from such conversation, thus the worldly would praise the Tathagata. Okay, so this is the same way that the Buddha was teaching in the previous chapter, where instead of saying, thou shall not do this, you know, I'm going to make a rule that nobody can talk about these things. That's not the way a Buddha teaches. Instead, he's just explaining what he does as part of his practice. And what a Buddha is doing is he's kind of creating this window into his life and into his mind and into his practice that other people can see what it is that he practices. And that through them learning about that, if they choose to practice these same things, then they will see that their mind becomes peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy too. A Buddha is not making rules or commandments or, or a list of forbidden activity. Instead, they're giving their students this window into their mind that they can then see what it is that they practice and why. And I imagine that students might have asked him, like you guys are asking me, well, why, Gautama Buddha, shouldn't we talk about armies? Why shouldn't we talk about villages and towns? And then he can expand upon it. This is the discourse. This is the, you know, here's the teaching. But then the Buddha would have added additional content as students ask questions about these things. So here, this is a way of teaching without creating a rule or forbidden activity uh, or any commandments, just giving people a window into the mind of the Buddha of what he practices, and then give them a chance to ask questions of why does he practice in this way. And then as they see the wisdom in that, then they might choose to practice the same way on their own. A Buddha doesn't have a craving to force people to practice what it is that they're practicing, but instead, like I said, has that window of opening up their mind to others so that people can get a glimpse and an understanding and a deep investigation of why that individual is practicing what it is that they're practicing. And through that investigation and you choosing to see the wisdom in that, then when you practice those same things, you'll see that your mind becomes peaceful, calm, serene, and consent with joy as well. Yes, sir. On Facebook, Tonka has a question, I think more relating to not having pointless chit chat and answering the question. She asks how to answer best the question of why don't you eat meat, sir? Yeah, so if somebody asks me why I don't eat meat, I let them know that I'm not interested in killing animals and having my decisions to uh, choose to kill animals. And the meat has drugs, toxins, and hormones in it that if I eat it, that it'll affect the health of the body and the mind. So I choose not to do these things out of compassion and loving kindness for the animals, but also out of loving kindness and compassion for this being that I call David or that we call David, because if I ingest those drugs, toxins, and hormones, it's going to affect the physical health of the body and the mind. Yes, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Uh, it does not appear there are any other questions at this time, sir. All right, so we go to chapter six. Yes, sir, let's go to Donnie to read chapter six, please. The monk refrains from pointless talk. Whereas some aesthetics and Brahmins remain addicted to such unedifying conversation as about kings, thieves, and ministers of state, talk about army dangers and wars, talk about food, drink, garment, and beds, Talk about garlands and scents, talk about relations, vehicles, villages, towns, cities, and countries, talk about women and talk about heroes, street talk and talk by the well, talk about those departed in days gone by, rambling chit chat, speculation about the world and about the sea, talk about this or that among the frames of such tasteful conversation. Thus, he is perfected in morality. Monks do not engage in the various states kinds of pointless talk, that is, talk about kings, thieves, and ministers of state, talk about armies, dangers, and war, talk about food, drinks, garments, and bait, talk about garlands and scents, talk about relations, villages, uh, vehicles, towns, cities, and countries, talk about women, and talk about heroes, street talk, and talk by the well, talk about those departed in days gone by, 
rambling chit chat, speculation about the world and about the sea, talk about this or that. For what reason? Because, monks, this talk is unbeneficial, ir irrelevant to the fundamentals of the holy life, and does not lead to fading away of strong feelings, to freedom from strong feelings, to illumination, to peace, to direct knowledge or experience, to enlightenment, to nibbana. When you talk, monks, you should talk about this is discontentedness. You should talk about this is the cause of discontentedness. You should talk about this is the elimination of discontentedness. You should talk about this is the way to the elimination of discontentedness. For what reason? Because, monks, this talk is beneficial, relevant to the fundamentals of the holy life, and leads to fading away of strong feelings, to freedom from strong feelings, to elimination, to peace, to direct knowledge, experience, to enlightenment, to nirvana. Therefore, monks, an effort should be made to understand. This is discontentedness. An effort should be made to understand. This is the cause of discontentedness. An effort should be made to disunderstand. This is the elimination of discontentedness. An effort should be made to understand. This is the way leading to the elimination of discontentedness. All right. Thank you, Dani. So the Buddha is taking that previous chapter that we read, all those pointless kinds of talk, and he's saying that <clears throat> he doesn't engage in these things, like is what he said in the last one as well, and now he's explaining the reason why. Because they don't lead to enlightenment. And he's encouraging his ordained practitioners to talk about the Four Noble Truths. That's what he's saying here. When he says, that, you know, when you talk, monks, you should talk about this is discontentedness. The Four Noble Truths is what leads to establishing right view and having that breakthrough. And as he taught more and more and more people, just thousands and thousands of people during his lifetime, they would then spread out and go start spending time in people's houses that were inviting them to come stay with them. And they would invite them to come essentially live with them for a couple of weeks or a couple of months, and they would learn the teachings that way. And the Buddha is encouraging them not to talk about chit chat and random things, but talk about the teachings that lead to enlightenment. That's what they should be focused on and dedicated to share. Now, in terms of talking about the Four Noble Truths and sharing the teachings, if somebody invited me into their home and I just sat down and be like, all right, let's talk about the Four Noble Truths. That's the only thing I can talk about is the Four Noble Truths. This wouldn't be wise, right? So when you go to someone's home, you need to sit down like, hi, how are you? Nice to meet you. Oh, this is your husband. Oh, nice to meet you, sir. Oh, this is your, your mother, your father, your children. Oh, your house looks very lovely, right? There's going to be a certain amount of getting acquainted with each other. Right. So sometimes when people read the Buddhist teachings, they think it's all one way or all another way. Right. It's either black or white. It's either dark or light. It's not that, you know, you should only speak about the teachings and that's the only thing you're willing to talk about. You're going to need to get acquainted with each other. You're going to need to build a relationship with somebody. So like when somebody comes to the temple to visit me, I had some new students come today. I'm saying, hi, how are you? Welcome. Nice to meet you you know, what's your name? And then they share and I say, where are you from? Oh, you're from Italy. Oh, you're from South Africa. Oh, okay. Nice to meet you. What do you do? You know, are you visiting Thailand? Are you here as a tourist? Are you working here? You know, I'm going to be asking questions like this because not only does it get me acquainted with them and them get acquainted with me, but it helps me understand their life a bit so that as they ask questions about these teachings, I'm more able to readily relate the teachings directly to their life. Whereas if I know nothing about a student, it's much more challenging for me to provide them penetrating wisdom that's actually helping them to understand the path to enlightenment. So while the Buddha is explaining here to stay focused on sharing the teachings as an ordained practitioner or as a teacher, it's important that you understand that there is going to be a certain warming up period where you get to know your students and you get to know the community. And this is actually purposeful speech. It's not pointless uh, talk, right? The Buddha is talking about pointless talk. There is a purpose behind, you know, where do you live? What is your job? You know, do you have a wife or a husband or a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a partner, or children? You know, what do you do on a daily basis? What are your hobbies? This is typically what I do when I meet with students on a one-on-one -on -one basis is I'll spend the first part of our personal guidance session just getting to know you. And I'll do that over multiple sessions 
where I'm still sharing the teachings with you, but I'm getting to know you over multiple sessions. And the more that I know about you in your life and what you're doing in your life, the more I can help you with these teachings. So this isn't pointless talk just because I'm not talking about the Four Noble Truths. It's actually helping me to discuss the Four Noble Truths with you when I understand certain things about your life and certain things that cause discontentedness in your life. So keep that in mind that while the Buddha is talking about here to refrain from pointless talk, there are certain things that you might be talking about that have a real purpose. And the purpose might be, I'm interested in building a relationship with this person. I'm interested in getting to know this person. I'm interested in seeing if this person might be a person that uh, would be a good boyfriend or girlfriend or husband or wife or a good employee or something like this. So there's going to be purposes behind your speech. For a ordained practitioner, for a teacher, our speech with our students is just to be able to understand them and understand their life so that then we can offer them teachings that are going to be most helpful for them. We're not going to be just chit-chatting about this thing or that thing uh, about different things, there's always going to be a purpose behind what we're talking about in any given point of our conversation. And the purpose that we have, if we're practicing right livelihood as an ordained practitioner and teacher, is our purpose is to help this person get to enlightenment. So any conversation about what's going on in your life, that's going to help us to help you get to enlightenment. And that's a purposeful way to speak. It's not pointless. So while the Buddha here is sharing to focus on sharing the Four Noble Truths as a ordained practitioner and a teacher, remember there's going to need to be some other discussion in order for you to get acquainted with this person and for this person to get acquainted with you. If you were just a stiff board that only talked about the teachings of the Buddha and that's all you ever talked about, uh, then people wouldn't be very interested in studying with you because you're not relatable. You're not somebody who understands them. So by talking to them about their life and understanding about their life, it can help you to help them to understand the Four Noble Truths. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? It does not appear that we have any questions at this time, sir. All right, so we'll move on to the next one which is in this section of lowly arts are not the wonder of psychic potency. Oh, sounds ominous. <laughs> um, three kinds of wonders. First discourse. There are, Brahman, these three kinds of wonders. What three? One, the mystic wonder. Two, the wonder of mind reading. And three, the wonder of instruction. One, and what, Brahman, is the mystic wonder? Here, a monk wields the various kinds of mystic potency. Having been one, he becomes many. Having been many, he becomes one. He appears and vanishes. He goes unhindered through a wall, through a protective barrier, through a mountain as through space, as though through space. He dives in and out of the earth as though it were water. He walks on water without sinking as though it were earth. Seated cross-legged, he cro travels in space like a bird. With his hand, he touches and strokes the moon and sun so powerful and mighty. He exercises mastery with the body as far as the Brahma world. This is called the mystic wonder. Two, and what Brahman is the wonder of mind reading? There is one who, by means of some clue, declares, your thought is thus, such is what you are thinking. Your mind is in such and such a state. And even if he makes many declarations, they are exactly so and not otherwise. Again, someone does not declare the state of mind on the basis of a clue, but he hears the sound of people, spirits, or deities speaking, and then declares, your thought is thus, such is what you are thinking, your mind is in such and such a state. And even if he makes many declarations, they are exactly so and not otherwise. Again, Someone does not declare the state of mind, and on the basis of a mark, or by hearing the sound of people, spirits, or deities speaking, but he hears the sound of the diffusion of thought as one is thinking and examining some matter, then declares, your thought is thus, such is what you are thinking, your mind is in such and such a state, and even if he makes many declarations, they are exactly so and not otherwise. Again, 
someone does not declare the state of mind on the basis of a mark or by hearing the sound of people, spirits, or deities speaking, or by hearing the sound of the diffusion of awe as one's thinking and examining some matter, but with his own mind, he encompasses the mind of one who has attained concentration without thought and examination, and he understands this person's mental activities are so disposed that immediately afterward, he will think this thought, and even if he makes many declarations, they are exactly so and not otherwise. This is called the wonder of mind reading. Three, and what, Brahman, is the wonder of instruction? Here, someone instructs others thus, think in this way and not in that way, attend to this and not to that, abandon this and enter and dwell in that. This is called the wonder of instruction. All right, thank you, Miranda. So what we're going to start learning about in this book, which is very interesting and something that we haven't really talked a whole lot about in this program, is these special abilities that start being acquired as part of moving the mind closer to enlightenment, is that as you eliminate pollution of the mind, you might observe certain special abilities is what I call them. Here, the Buddha is calling them the mystic of wonder, the mystic of mind reading, the, myst the wonder of instruction. Uh, here, this special ability that the Buddha is talking about, the mystic of wonder, I've never actually witnessed this myself, but I've seen in the Pali Canon that there's discussion of this where people can essentially, uh, you know, kind of move through walls and, you know, elevate themselves and levitate and things like this. I've only ever seen that with optical illusions. I've never seen it uh, and I've never experienced it for myself. So uh, I don't know that this actually is able to occur. They wrote it down in the Pali Canon, so I suspect that it's true and that there are people that can do these things, but I've never seen it myself. But the way it's being presented is that it's one of these special abilities that occur as the mind becomes more and more enlightened. The second one is the wonder of mind reading. This one I have experienced for myself, and uh, I've also seen other people do it as well, that as the mind becomes more and more enlightened, you can actually know what's on other people's minds without them telling you. Uh, and you can know the future of what's going to happen for people without any other information other than your own insight. That, And that's why the Buddha is saying that as you make these declarations, that it's exactly so and not otherwise, that you have confirmed confidence that you are reading somebody's mind and this can occur and you might observe this. It's not where you sit and you actively try to read somebody's mind. It's that as you're talking with somebody, you know things about th this person that they haven't told you. And then if you speak up and you're like, hey, do you have a relative that has died recently? They're like, yep, I sure do. And it's like, oh, I understood that. And they didn't even tell you that, but you knew that. And then in some cases, you might be able to tell them why their family member died, how they died, and all the different details about that. And this is something that occurs as the mind becomes more enlightened, that this wonder of mind reading is something that you might experience. And then there's this wonder of instruction, where as you become more and more enlightened and you gain this wisdom, the Buddha calls it almost like a miracle to be able to instruct these teachings. Here it's called the wonder of instruction, that as you develop more and more wisdom, eradicating the pollution of mind, you develop the ability to provide these teachings for the benefit of others. And he describes it as a wonder or like this special ability. And what you're going to ultimately see that the Buddha talks about is he says that he doesn't practice this mystic wonder of moving through walls and elevating and levitating and things like this. He doesn't do that. Um, he doesn't do mind reading. Even though he knows that these things exist, just like I know that they exist, we don't do them as part of our practice. We need to let those go, realizing that that is something that occurs as a special ability in the mind. But if the mind stays attached to these things, then you're not going to be able to get to full liberation. 
What he ultimately talks about is he talks about the real wonder that he brings to the world is not this mind reading, not this mystical, magical stuff, but this wonder of instruction. That's the real kind of miracle, so to speak, that he performs on a regular basis is being able to provide instruction to people about the path to enlightenment that allows them to then learn and practice to be able to get to enlightenment themselves. That's the real wonder. That's the real goal of an aesthetic. And what he encourages his students to do is to develop their practice to the point where they let go of all those other things, those mystical, magical, psychic things, but instead focus on actually providing instruction that's going to help people get to enlightenment themselves. Because as long as you stay clinging or attached to those other mystical, magical things, those psychic things, then you're not going to be able to focus on providing instruction. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? Yes, sir. it's understood that this wonder of instruction is the most beneficial of these wonders. Is there any benefit to the other two? The mind is thinking that having that ability of mind reading, knowing what is the mental state of a person, knowing what's on their mind, that might be beneficial for someone who is teaching? Mm -hmm. So I can't speak on this first one because I've never seen it uh, from someone else. I've never experienced it myself. I can speak on the second one that uh, reading somebody's mind is helpful as a teacher, but in terms of like intricate details of what's going on in their life, it's better for me to hear that from the student and hear it from their perspective rather than assuming that my ability to read somebody's mind is 100% accurate. And I've seen situations where like students have come to learn with me. I used to teach at a temple where like tourists could just come up and sit down and be like, hi, I'd like to talk to you. I have this problem. I have this problem. Can you help me? Um, and it's kind of like almost like a triage environment. And I would have people sometimes come down and sit with me and they would sit. And I would turn to them and I would say, have you had a family member recently die? And they said, yes, it was my dad. And I said, and you would like to know why he died, right? You don't understand why he died? And they said, no, I don't understand. It's been something that's been bothering me because he died when I was like a three-year-old child. And I don't know why he died. And I was able to tell her why he died and how he died. And it allowed her to release that from her mind, it allowed her to help her let go of any craving or clinging to know that information. So in those situations, I've used it in order to help somebody, but it's not something that I do on a regular basis or have it as a base part of my practice. Instead, as a teacher, I'm more interested in observing students and how they interact with each other and their family and their children and stuff like that. And then ask the student questions to understand their life and what it is that they're experiencing in life based on what they're explaining and based on what I'm observing, I can then provide them teachings that will actually help them. So rather than rely on the mind reading as like a way of practice, and that's the only thing that I'm doing, instead, I'm using that with other things to be able to then help the person. But it's not a, a primary thing that I would choose to do. Definitely wouldn't choose to make money with it, but it's not something that is necessarily um, advisable because sometimes you can go into some of the things that you're understanding from someone's mind and they can get really discontent because there was another situation where I was talking and I was just talking and I wasn't trying to read this person's mind, but I started talking about um, her mom dying and she started crying. And I said, your mom recently died, hasn't she? And she said, yeah. And she started crying which was fine. You know, that's her discontentedness that helped her to release it. And she started asking me questions about her mom, but this can actually cause problems if you get into this too much and too much detail with people. It's almost like fortune telling. And even though for a period of time, for maybe like six months to a year, this ability was really profound in my mind and I was able to help certain people, I had to be willing to let that go in order to get to liberation. And now I have this omniscience where I know things that are going to happen before they happen. Like I'll, 
I won't hear from a student for like a year or two. And then I'll start thinking about that person. And then they'll call me like a day later or two days later, or they'll send me a private message. So I'll know things that are going to happen before they happen. And it happens continuously almost every day that I know about things that are going to happen before they happen. But this isn't really wise to rely on those things as part of your baseline practice, but instead to let that go. If those things come up into the mind where you have this omniscience and or you can read the minds of others or do these special abilities start to become more and pro more profound, I suggest just using it as an example of Yes, I see exactly what the Buddha is talking about here, that as the pollution of the mind is eliminated, that these special abilities become more and more profound. But you need to get to the point where you let those go and you don't rely on them as part of your baseline practice, that they're just there, that they can support you and help you in your practice, but you don't rely on them as a foundation of your practice. Yes, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. I understand. Mm -hmm. Does not appear we have any other questions at this time, sir. All right, so now we go to the next one, chapter eight. Yes, sir. Let's go to Donnie to read chapter eight, please. Miranda. Three kinds of wonder, second discourse. There are three kinds of wonder, Kavadada, which I, having myself understood and realized them, having made known to others, and what are the three? The mystic wonder, the one of mind reading, and wonder of instruction. And what, Kavadada, is the mystic wonder? In this case, Kavadada, suppose that a brother enjoys the possession in various ways of mystic power. From being one, he becomes multiform. From being multiform, he becomes one. From being visible, he becomes invisible. He passes through without hindrance to the other side of a wall or a battlement or mountain, as if through air. He penetrates up and down through solid ground as if through water. He walks on water without diving it, as if on solid ground. He travels cross-legged through the sky like the birds on wing. He touches and feels with the hand even the moon and the sun, beings of mystic power and potency, though they may they be. He reaches even in the body up to the heavenly realm, and some believer of trusting heart should behold him doing so. Then that believer shall announce the fact to an unbeliever, saying, wonderful, sir, and marvelous is the mystic power and potency of the aesthetic. Then that unbeliever should say to him, well, sir, there is a certain charm called a Gandhara charm. It is by his own ability that he performs all this. Now, what think you, brother, huh? may not the unbeliever say, so say? Yes, sir, he might. Well, brother, huh? it is because I perceive danger in the practice of mystic wonders that I disagree and refrain from and am reluctant to perform. And what, Kavadaha, is the wonder of mind reading? Suppose in this case that a brother can make known to the heart and feelings, the reasonings and the thoughts of other beings, of other individuals saying, so and so is in your mind, you are thinking of such and such a matter, thus and thus are your emotions, and some believer of trusting heart should see him doing so, then that believer should announce the fact to an unbeliever saying, wonderful sir, and marvelous is the mystic power and potency of the aesthetic. Then that unbeliever should say to him, well sir, there is a charm called the jewel charm. It is by his own ability that he performs orders. And what, thank you, Kavada, may not the unbeliever say so? Yes sir, he might. Well, Kavada, it is because I perceive danger in the practice of the wonder of my reading that I disagree uh, and refrain from and am reluctant to perform. And what, Kavadaha, is the wonder of instruction? Suppose, Kavadaha, that a brother teaches us thus, reason in this way, do not reason in that way, consider thus and not thus. Get rid of this disposition, train yourself and remain in that. This, Kavadaha, is what is called the wonder of instruction. And further, Kavada, suppose that a Tathagata is born into the world, one who has won the truth, an Arahant, a fully awakened one, abounding in wisdom and joy, goodness, joyful who knows all worlds, unsurpassed, as a guide to humans, willing to be led, a teacher for gods and humans, perfectly enlightened one, a Buddha. He by himself, 
thoroughly knows and sees as it were face to face this universe, including the worlds above the gods, the Brahmas and the Amaras, and the worlds below its aesthetics and Brahmins, its princes and people, and having no name, he makes his wisdom known to others. The truth, lovely in its origin, lovely in its progress, lovely in its completion, does he proclaim, both in the spirit and in the letter, the higher life does he know, make known, in all its fullness and all its purity. A householder, or one of his children, or a man of inferior birth in any class, listens to that truth, and on hearing it, he has confidence in the Tathagata, the one who has found the truth, and when he is possessed of the confidence he consists, considers thus within himself. Full of hindrance is household life, a path or the dust of passion. Free as the air is the life of him who has pronounced all worldly things. How difficult it is for the man who dwells at home to live the higher life in all its fullness, in all its purity, in all its bright perfection. Let me then cut off my hair and beard, let me clothe myself in the orange colored robes and let me go forth from the household life into a homeless life. Then before long, renouncing his portion of wealth, be great or small, leaving behind his circle of relatives, be they many or be they few. He cuts off his hair and beard, he clothes himself in the orange colored robes and he goes forth from the household life into the homeless life. When he has thus become trained by that restraint that he should be binding on an aesthetic, uprightness is his delight, and he sees danger in the least of things he should avoid. He adopts and tra trains himself in the precepts. He encompasses himself with wholesome deeds in actions and speech. Pure are his means of livelihood, wholesome in his conduct. That the door of his senses, mindful and self-possessed, he is all together joyful. And how, Kavadada, is his conduct wholesome? In this, Kavadada, that the monk, putting away the killing of living beings, abandoning the destruction of life, and sword he has laid aside, and reluctant to roughness, and for mercy he recites compassionate and crying kind to all creatures that have life. Kavadada, this is called the wonder of destruction. If his mind are serene, be pure, translucent, cultured, free of evil, flexible, ready to act, firm and imperturbable, unable to be upset or excited, calm, serene, he directs and bends down his mind to the wisdom of the destruction of the deadly floods. He knows as it really is. This is discontentedness. He knows as it really is. This is the cause of discontentedness. He knows as it really is. This is the elimination of discontentedness. He knows as it really is. This is the path that leads to the elimination of discontentedness. He knows as they really are. These are the daily floods. He knows as it really is. This is the cause of the daily floods. He knows as it really is. This is the elimination of the daily floods. He knows as it is. This is the path that leads to the elimination of daily floods to him. Thus knowing, thus seeing, the mind is free from the daily poison of craving, set free from daily poison of anger, set free from the daily poison of ignorance, knowing of true reality. In him, thus set free, there arises no knowledge of his liberation, and he knows. Rebirth has been destroyed, the holy life has been fulfilled. What has to be done has been accomplished. After this present life, there will be no beyond. Just Kavada, as if in a mountain fastness there were a pool of water, clear, translucent and serene, and a man standing on the bank, and with eyes to see, she perceived the oysters and shells, the gravel and the pebbles and the shoals of fish, as they move about or lie within it, you would know. This pool is clear, transparent and serene, and there within it are the oysters and the shells, and the sand and gravel and the shoals of fish are moving about or lying still. This Kabbada is what is called the wonder of instruction. So this Kabbada are the three kinds of wonder I've understood and realized myself and made known to others. All right. Thank you, Donnie. <clears throat> so here, this is the Buddha 
explaining what I was explaining previously that he doesn't practice this mystic of wonder. He's reluctant to do it. And the reason why he's saying that is because if somebody's seeing that, you know, miracle, you know, somebody who doesn't understand these teachings is going to have difficulties wondering, you know, like, what is this guy doing? This person who's sharing the teachings to get to enlightenment, performing this kind of miracle, essentially, is what the Buddha is describing here. So the Buddha's seeing that this there's this danger in him performing any kind of miracle, so he doesn't do that. He's saying he disagrees with it and he refrains from it. He's reluctant to perform it. And the same thing with mind reading. Even though he knows that these things exist, he's saying that he's reluctant to perform it because it can create perceptions in the minds of the people who's coming to learn with him of like, what's this guy doing? You know, kind of thing is like, you know, performing these kind of miracle things. And essentially what he gets to is this wonder of instruction. This is what the Buddha performs, is this ability to instruct and guide people on the path to enlightenment. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? It does not appear there are any questions at this time, sir. All right. So now we'll go to chapter 9, which is in this section, Monk's Way of Conduct Towards Wonder of Mystic Power and Other Kinds of Power. Chapter 9. The perfectly enlightened one prohibits monks from exhibiting a wonder of mystic power. <laughs> the venerable Pindola, the Bharadvaja, shown his mystic power, having risen above the ground, having taken hold of that, of that the bowl of the great merchant of Rajagaha, was brought down by him, circled three times around Rajagaha. Then the perfectly enlightened one on this occasion, in this connection, having had the community of monks gather, questioned the venerable Pindala, the Bard Vajra, saying, Is it true, as is said, Bard Vajra, that the bowl of the great merchant of Rajagaha was fetched down by you? It is true, venerable sir. It is not suiting, Bard Vajra. It is not becoming. It is not fitting. It is not worthy of an ascetic. It is not allowable. It is not to be done. How can you, Bharat Vajra, on account of a cheap wooden bowl, exhibit a condition of furtherment, a wonder of mystic power to householders? As, Bharat Vajra, a woman exhibits her loincloth on account of a cheaply stamped masaka, a small bean used as a standard of weight and value, hence a small coin of very low value. Even so by you, Bharat Vajra, was a condition of furtherment, a wonder of mystic power exhibited to householders on account of a cheap wooden bowl. It is not Bharat Vajra for pleasing those who are not yet pleased, nor for increasing the number of those who are pleased, but Bharat Vajra, it is displeasing to those who are not pleased as well as to those who are pleased, and it causes wavering in some. Having guided him, having given reason talk, he addressed the monks saying, Monks, a condition of furthermen, a wonder of mystic power is not to be exhibited to householders. Whoever should exhibit them, there is an offense of wrongdoing. Break, monks, this wooden bowl, having reduced it to fragments, give them to monks as perfume to mix with ointment. And, monks, a wooden bowl should not be used. Whoever should use one, there is an offense of wrongdoing. Okay, thank you, Miranda. So what the Buddha is uh, doing here is there was an aesthetic who basically was showing off, right? He was showing off this mystic power of being able to, you know, elevate, it sounds like, um, in, or levitate and grab this bowl out of the sky and bring it back down for a merchant. And the Buddha found out about this and he's like, hey, you know, why did you do this? And, uh, you know, did you do this? And the, the aesthetic admits like, yeah, that's what I did. And the Buddha is saying that, you know, by doing that, there's going to be people that are pleased with you doing that. And there's going to be other people who aren't pleased with you doing that. And it's going to cause wavering in people's minds who may not be interested in learning and practicing the teachings when they see this kind of mystical, magical things that are happening. So the Buddha discouraged people from showing off, of course, because that would be conceit or arrogance or pride. And when he talks about this condition of further men, what he's talking about are these special abilities that 
uh, are acquired as part of the mind moving closer and closer to enlightenment. So you'll see a chapter where he talks about where if you have acquired the jhanas or any of the stages of enlightenment, that it's not appropriate to share this with other people because of that potential of people walking around puffed up, boastful about, you know, I've attained this and I've attained that and I'm better than you and I'm better than this. And let me show you what I can do. I can read people's minds. I can uh, levitate. I can grab bowls out of the air. And he's saying none of these things should be done because he knows that he's sharing these teachings to eliminate the pollution of people's minds. And as people are learning those things, they're kind of in various stages of development. They're maybe not quite enlightened yet, but they're starting to have these certain abilities of, in this case, talking about uh, levitating, having mind reading and things like this, and all these different special abilities start coming into the mind. But because conceit is a higher fetter, as the pollution is eliminating from the mind, you can start developing these special abilities, but still have conceit in the mind. The mind's not yet quite enlightened, but yet it has these special abilities. So he's guiding them here about how to eliminate conceit and arrogance and pride and being boastful and showing off these special abilities so that they can actually get to enlightenment rather than clinging to this special ability of doing something that kind of wows the crowd, so to speak. And this is can occur that as people are getting more and more enlightened, if there's still that conceit or that arrogance or pride in there, these kind of things can happen. So a Buddha is there to help them understand like, hey, this isn't the way of practice. This isn't what I'm essentially teaching you guys to do. I'm teaching you to get to enlightenment and then share the teachings with others of how to get to enlightenment. I'm not teaching you to go around and show off your special abilities and show everybody how great you are from eliminating your pollution of mind. Instead, stay focused on the goal, which is to actually get to enlightenment. That's what he's ultimately doing in his teachings. What questions do you guys have here in this chapter? It does not appear there are any questions at this time, sir. All right, so we have just one last chapter here, chapter 10. Yes, sir. Let's go to Donnie to read chapter 10, please. Thank you, Miranda. The perfectly enlightened one prohibits monks from boasting about the non-existence of state of further man in oneself. Whatever monk shall bo should boast with reference to himself of a state of further man attainment of jhanas or stage of enlightenment, sufficient noble wisdom and insight, though not fully knowing it fully and saying, this I know, this I see, and then if later on he being pressed or not being pressed, fallen shall aspire to be purified and should say, your vulnerable sir, I said that I know what I do not know, see what I do not see, I spoke idly, falsely, conceit, Apart from the undue estimate on himself, he also is one who is defeated. He is not in communion. Okay, thank you, Dani. What the Buddha is talking about here is as somebody's choosing to be a teacher, as an ordained practitioner or a teacher, that we should only speak about the things that we know about. If a student asks a question and we don't know something, we should say, I don't know. I don't know that. Um, if somebody is speaking about something that they don't know, but they're speaking about it as if they know, this is going to be misleading to the people who are learning with them. So an ordained practitioner or teacher without conceit should be able to say, I don't know this, and then admit that to their students so that they're not spreading false information. Also, the Buddha talks about that person shouldn't boast about their attainment of the jhanas or stages of enlightenment because it's not something to be boastful about. If you've attained something on this path as an ordained practitioner or as a household practitioner, there's no need to be boastful about this with other people. In During the lifetime of the Buddha, he shared with people that he was a fully perfectly enlightened Buddha. He was a fully perfectly enlightened one because people didn't understand what that was during his lifetime. So he needed to explain to people what enlightenment was, that he was enlightened and that he was the fully perfectly enlightened one. But now, 2,500 years later, we know this wisdom and we know how to determine whether someone is enlightened or not enlightened. If somebody went around boasting that they were enlightened, 
then we could surmise that they're not enlightened because they're being boastful. They have arrogance, they have pride, they have ego. So if somebody's claiming that they're enlightened, that's one of the best ways to know that they're actually not enlightened. And here the Buddha is explaining that in so many words, is saying, hey, be honest about what you share, be honest about the teachings that you share. If you don't know something, say you don't know. Don't be puffed up with conceit and say that you know something when you really don't. And then in terms of your attainments, you shouldn't be sharing this with anybody. It should really be for your own personal growth and your own personal development, as well as you might talk with your teacher. You might say to your teacher, I think I'm in the first jhana, or I think I've attained the first stage of enlightenment, or I think I'm in the second stage of enlightenment. Can you perhaps help me to discern whether that's actually true or not? Right? These are things that a, a student might discuss privately with their teacher, but that's only for their own personal growth and their own personal development. They're not going to then leave and tell everybody like, oh, my teacher said I'm in the second stage of enlightenment. Look how great I am. Look how wonderful I am. Um, so these kind of things are being taught because as your mind becomes more and more enlightened, the ego is oftentimes one of the last things to go from the mind. And as you become more and more enlightened, there might be this arrogance or this boastfulness or this conceit, this pride that comes into the mind, even though you're not enlightened yet. And as long as you allow that conceit and that arrogance and pride and ego to be there, you won't ever get to enlightenment. So the Buddha is helping his students to realize, hey, you know, don't do these things because it's going to hinder you from getting to enlightenment. So rather than be boastful or prideful or conceited, then just be humble. And if you don't know something, say you don't know it. And then don't share your attainments or your stages of enlightenment with anybody other than perhaps your teacher in order to help you plot future further growth. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? It does not appear there are any questions at this time, sir. All right. Well, I will just thank all of you guys for joining for today's class. As you see, this is a very different topic than what we've been talking about in the past few months with the cycle of rebirth. We've come out of volume 11, moving into a new book, and now there's a lot more things to talk about because there's a lot of different things that are happening in some of these discourses. And as I shared at the beginning, this book is predominantly for ordained practitioners and teachers, but there are certain things that you can extrapolate out of it for household practitioners, like the chapter we just talked about, is that as your mind starts experiencing attainments and stages of enlightenment, you wouldn't be interested in being boastful and sharing that with other people. And this is going to help you to ensure that you don't have conceits and it'll lead to further progress. Because as long as somebody's being boastful about what they've obtained, if somebody's going around boasting that they're in the first or second stage of enlightenment or the third stage of enlightenment, they're not going to ever get to the fourth stage where their mind is actually enlightened because there's still conceit there. So these teachings that the Buddha is sharing, in some cases, because he's talking directly to the ordained practitioners, he's a little bit more direct where he's saying, you know, you've committed an offense or you've committed a wrongdoing. You know, he's a little bit more direct with them because he's living side by side with them. They're kind of looking to the Buddha like he's a father in certain situations. So he's going to be much more direct and uh, specific with them. Where in other teachings, you can see that it's a little bit more wide open in the way that he's talking. He's still clear, concise, and precise, but he's not going to say, you know, to a household practitioner, you know, you've committed a wrongdoing. Because with the uh, aesthetics, the ordained practitioners and teachers, he's guiding them to be even more refined than the average enlightened being. A household practitioner can get to enlightenment, but for someone who's choosing to be a teacher or an ordained practitioner, they need to be even more refined in their practice because they're setting an example for others as a role model of how to practice these teachings. So if he has ordained practitioners out there that are sharing these teachings, but they're talking pointless talk, they're having chit chat, they're talking about politics, they're talking about wars, they're talking about different things, they're practicing lowly arts, they're doing fortune telling, they're you know doing all these kind of things that we've been talking about today. 
then this is going to set a poor example for other people of how to practice these teachings. So he's going to talk to his ordained practitioners and anybody who's aspiring to be a teacher in a much more direct and specific way to ensure that they're very refined in their practice of how they actually go out into the world and practice these teachings. But like I mentioned, you can extrapolate certain things from these teachings that are going to help you in your practice. So thank you all for your dedication to learning and practicing these teachings. The next class, next Saturday, we're going to be in chapters 11 through chapters 20. And you can read these before class if you like, and that'll probably help you develop questions around them. You can download these by going to buddhadailywisdom.com and clicking on free books. And you can get them free. You can print that file for free if you like, or you can order these books on Amazon and pick them up that way in a, in a nicely printed version. Tomorrow in the group learning program, we're going to be in chapter 24 of volume one. This chapter is titled Misunderstandings of Gautama Buddha's Teachings. Now that I've shared in the group learning program over six and a half months what the teachings that lead to enlightenment are, now we're going to talk about misunderstandings and things that are largely misunderstood in the world using the words of the Buddha so that you can see that it's not just my perspective, that it indeed is related specifically to the teachings of the Buddha because over 2,500 years, these teachings have been declining. And while there might be a meditation center, there might be a Buddhist temple, there might be authors writing things about the Buddha's teachings, it doesn't necessarily mean they're true. But through you learning and practicing and independently verifying, you can see what's true and what's false. In the things that I've been teaching in the group learning program, things like there are no rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship in the Buddhist teachings. If you go to a Buddhist temple, one of the first things you might end up seeing is rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship. You're going to be like, hold on a second. What did David teach me over the last six and a half months? He said there's no rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship, but here I am in a real Buddhist temple with real Buddhist monks, and they're practicing rites, rituals, and ceremonies, and worship. You know, what gives? Why did he teach me this? Well, I'm going to help you see what these things are that you're going to see in some environments that are saying that they're sharing Buddhist teachings and help you understand why they're misunderstandings. Not as a way to say these people are bad or they're wrong or they're unwholesome or anything like that. They're just lacking the wisdom of the teachings. And because of this oral tradition, things have been changed over 2,500 years. But when you go back to the original source teachings and when you independently verify for yourself to see the truth, then you know what is the true path to enlightenment. So I've been illuminating the path to enlightenment for students all throughout the six and a half months of, of the group learning program. And by sharing the misunderstandings, it further illuminates the path to enlightenment because you can see in environments that you might move in and out of or centers that you might move in and out of or books that you might pick up, you can see very clearly through your own investigation and your own independent verification what is true and what is false by understanding the true teachings, but by also understanding the misunderstandings. So that's what we're going to be talking about tomorrow in the group learning program. And then on Wednesday, we're going to be doing loving kindness meditation together. So you're welcome to join for our loving kindness meditation on Wednesday. We'll see you guys in a future class. Have a very wonderful and lovely rest of your day. Sawadee
Thank you again for watching. Enjoy your meditation. Look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have. Thank you so much. Thank you.